A very good morning and welcome to today's session on BIC streams. Climate change and the art of devotion, geo aesthetics in the land of Krishna, 1550 to 1850. Our panelists today are Sugata Ray and Anapurna Garimela. Thank you, Sugata and Anapurna, for joining us today and doing this for us. Uh, we will be posting the full bios of today's speakers in the chat box. Please post your questions in the Q&A section, which is next to the chat box. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. And over to you, Sugata. Thank you, Raghu. And, and thank you to uh, BIC for inviting me. And I'm thrilled to be in conversation with Annapurna, as I was mentioning to her. I think we're meeting after 20 years. Last time I saw her, I was an MA kid in Baroda. So it's really a great pleasure to, to see her, even if it's virtual. And I hope we can have a conversation in person in some day in the near future. So as an art historian, I have a PowerPoint. I mean, I can't do anything without images. So if you will, if I, I'll, have, I'll share the screen and so when, when Raghu had asked me to give a talk uh, based on my recent book, uh, I thought what I could do is broadly talk about the question, the methods, the, the imperatives and the questions that led to this book. And then, then maybe talk about a few examples from the book and then open it up to the conversation with Annapurna and the audience. So what you see on, on the screen is a 2011 installation by the Delhi-based artist Asim Wakif, uh, titled Help, Yamuna's Protest. Wakif placed the word help, which he had fashioned out of plastic bottles and LED lights in the river Yamuna. The installation as you, as can be seen in Wakif's prints appears to suggest against the grain of reason that the river can think for itself. And in English, it's extreme distress over its polluted plight. Wakif is, of course, not the only contemporary artist to engage with the limits and boundaries of what constitutes the object of environmental discourse. As we face climate change and large scale environmental devastation globally, artists across the world are exploring how art practice, political ecologies, and environmental activism can challenge the anthropocentrism of human sovereignty. On the screen, we have a still from a film by the London-based art collective, the Autolid Group, on geological time and seismic history of California. What the project was, was essentially to show how tectonic forces express themselves in the landscape, how, how the very geological force of the earth becomes visible from the fault lines, deep fault lines to the hairline cracks on cast concrete. And this is a highway, which of course, when we think of California, we think of automobiles, we think of highways, and how do we imagine the, shape, the force of the earth itself uh, shaping, let's say, the concrete uh, highways of California. EcoArt, that is the term that is now being used as it is provisionally being called, offers a way of being in the world, of seeing human beings and the environment as inextricably intertwined or even endowing non-human objects, forces, and life form with an agent of power. Now we must remember that artistic engagements with and in response to the natural environment is hardly a contemporary phenomenon. In the seventh century, the Pallava rulers of South India, for instance, had commissioned a colossal relief depicting the descent of the Ganga on a boulder facing the Bay of Bengal at Mamallapuram. What is interesting about this relief is that the natural cleft between the two boulders was transformed into the river 
as water cascaded down from a cistern on the summit of the rock. And in turn, there, what happens is a coalescing of flowing water, literal physical water, and the mythological narrative of the river's descent. What this particular relief makes visible is it really foregrounds that how in pre-modern aesthetic systems that the, inter, that the natural and the cultural worlds were fundamentally interwoven. We can, for instance, see how the Pallavas mobilize the geological force of the natural world, both the hydrological dynamism of flowing water and expansive oceanic spaces, because we must remember that this was facing the Indian Ocean to enunciate an art practice as early as the seventh century. Later in the 16th century, what is called the early modern period, emperors and merchants, whether in Florence or in Mughal India, established gardens as a form of managing and mastering the environment. Scholars have written about a lot about Mughal gardens and the idea of both visualizing, that is depicting gardens and establishing gardens, scholars have suggested, was a technique aimed at controlling the environment by reordering it. So art and architecture, by its very nature, from the prehistory to the present, has engaged with the natural environment in some way or the other. If we think about the Emperor Babur, for instance, the emperor who establishes the Mughal Empire, he describes in the Babur, he describes his the 15 or four renovations to the Istalif Garden, 20 miles northwest of Kabul. And I quote from the Baba Nama. Formerly its course was zigzag and irregular. I had made it straight and orderly. So that the place became very beautiful. The garden then was a visual manifestation of Baba's power and authority mapped out quite literally onto the land owned by the emperor. To stop at the mapping of power and authority, however, would mean, would mean stopping short of a methodological move that I have described in my book as eco-art history. For an eco-art history is not merely a history of human intervention in managing, ordering, refining, defying, aestheticizing, or transforming the natural environment. If that was the case, there's really not much to be said beyond an expansion of the archive, that is, more examples, more case studies, more histories that makes visible how, human, how humans, as we as a species, have engaged and ordered the natural world whether it is in the past or in the present, whether it is hydrological infrastructure in a, in a site like Saatchi, 16th century paintings that depict Babur reordering the garden as a form of imperialism or even colonial botany. So what my book proposed that eco-art history offers a complete shift in art history, one that is receptive to the agentive force of the earth in relation to human action on it. That is, it is not just about how we as a species have controlled and ordered the environment, but to really think about the mutual imbrication, the, the mutual relationship between the earth and human species and the human species. How do ecological clusters, for instance, inflect art history? Now, we must remember art history, like many forms of cultural history, whether it's literary history, uh, music history, all, uh, or sort of human, the humanities broadly, takes the human as the focus of analysis. In art history, we write about artists, we write about patrons, we write about audiences. So the human being becomes the center of of art historical analysis. What my book was trying to think through is that 
how do we write art histories that take seriously the environment, that take seriously stone, rivers, plants, and what sort of art history emerges when we bring together the different species that inhabit the earth, but also natural forms like earth and, <coughs> excuse me, like the river. So maybe I could give a few examples from my book, which focuses on, on Vrindavan and Mathura, Braj, the pilgrimage site near Delhi, where we all know the divine Krishna is believed to have spent his youth. So let me begin with my first chapter, which focuses on water. And I'm cutting diagonally across the picture plane. The blue river flows beyond the border of the painting to a space elsewhere, a space that is conceivably beyond representation. It is the transversal movement of the fleeting diagonal, more than the height of the vertical or the repose of the horizontal that allows for the precipitous passage of the river through Braj, the bucolic site where the divine Krishna is believed to have spent his youth. A visual translation of a verse from the Bhagavata Purana, a text that had become central to 16th century Vaishnava praxis in Braj, the painting illustrates Krishna's amorous play in the river Yamuna with the gopis of Braj. Tired from the pleasures of love, Krishna, who has lost all inhibitions, enters the water of the flowing river with his beloved devotees. Thus begins the Jalkrira, the water sport. We are in the mid 16th century, around 1560, a merchant family residing near the established, near, near the pilgrimage center of Braj commissions this massive illustrated manuscript of the Bhagavata Purana, the canonical text for worshippers of Krishna, a visual translation of a verse from the 10th book of the text. The painting illustrates Krishna's play in the river Yamuna with the gopis. Surrounded by the gopis, the bejeweled body of Krishna flows with the turbulent undercurrent of the river towards an arena beyond the yellow margin that marks the limit of the painting, the limit of representation. The artist has carefully tilted the pictorial plane to create a sense of spatial recession, while the river flowing in a wide swath diagonally cuts across the surface along a central axis, disregarding margins and boundaries that define the painted surface. Even though the primary theme of the painting is Krishna's play, the Jalkrira, it seems that the artist has deliberately used pictorial configurations to draw the viewer's attention to the blue river with lotuses, blooming creepers, and frolicking cattle. The blue of Krishna's body blends into the liquescent blue of the river, making it difficult to discern the separation between the river and the divine body. Now in art history, this manuscript, this mid 16th century manuscript, the Isarda Bhagavata Purana, and it's called the Isarda Bhagavata Purana because it was found in Isarda near Jaipur. It is really a very important manuscript to chart how early modern or uh, 16th century paintings were established in South Asia. If we compare, for instance, this Bhagavata Purana with one that was produced of uh, 30 years before, 1520s, again in the same region, Delhi Agra region, uh, we see the, the massive transition that our manuscript, the Isarda, one on your left, uh, shows. Early, earlier paintings, for instance, the Bhagavata on the right, typically you would have flat monochromatic backgrounds, uh, angular figures, silhouettes, compartmental units with very solid line. The river in the 1520s folio functions like a flat background, literally like a theatrical 
backdrop in front of which the narrative is being played out. So the river is like almost like a theatrical background and the Jalkrira is playing out in front of that. The river Yamuna is also depicted in a characteristic basket work pattern. That's a term used by art historians, basket work pattern. Essentially very clear lines, white lines, parallel white lines against deep blue water. Now, while both the folios, one from the 1520s, one from the 1560s, produced in the same region, more or less, do have some commonalities. For instance, the poetic tropes that can be, that is signaled with waterfowls and blooming lotuses, which shows a certain shared vocabulary of imagining sacred space. The Yamuna, moved from the background to the very center of the picture plane only in a matter of 30 years. Now, why did that happen? Why did the Yamuna suddenly become the center of pictorial attention? We might turn to the Mughals. We might turn to the courtly culture of the Mughal empire. We know that under Akbar, the Imperial Atelier had started producing prodigious manuscripts with astounding paintings. We do see a similarity between, let's say, the Hamza Nama, a manuscript commissioned by Akbar around 1562, within six years of ascending the throne. The, the folio on the right from the Hamza Nama shows the prophet Elias rescuing Hamza's nephew. But again, if you look at the way the water is depicted, the translucence of cresting wind-driven waves, we see a very similar mode of depicting water in our Bhagavata Purana. Both these manuscripts, one produced in the Mughal court, one produced in the Delhi Agra region, show a very similar way of depicting turbulent water which suggests that scholars have suggested then that the Bhagavata Purana that we began with marks a transition point in, imagine, in painterly practices because it is drawing from Mughal courtly cultures, which are coming from, let's say, Central Asian Timurid practices. Indeed, a number of folios in this manuscript in this particular Bhagavata manuscript seems to have used a similar visual strategy, one that highlights the dynamism of flowing water while accentuating the river within the picture plane. In all three folios, the river starts from one margin and flows out as a way perhaps of negotiating the Timurid or Mughal aesthetic practices that, had, that were really growing prominent in South Asia in the mid 16th century. But an eco art history would propose that the landscape is neither a natural given nor merely a construction of human experience. We also must look at text, for instance, the, the visual and the moral aesthetics of seeing the Yamuna as it flows through Braj was eulogized in texts. In texts, for instance, the Yamuna Stakam, an early 16th century hymn to the Yamuna, the metaphor of seeing sacred space expanded the liquescence of water to seep into conceptions of the ecosystem, the sand that shines brightly that glistens like the lotus feet of Krishna, plants that make the river fragrant, peacocks and swans that gather by the water, and monsoon clouds as dark as the water itself. Depicting the Yamuna as it flows through Braj, paintings such as these, and I argue, appears to valorize the act of seeing water as a form of theological aesthetic, a non-anthropomorphic idolatry that is not just worshiping icons, but worship, worshiping the river itself, but one that does not disentangle nature from culture. Rather, the manuscript 
conceives of a horizon where the material, where seeing the water, the materiality of water allowed for an imaginative geography in 16th century North India. Could the experience of water then be a combination of aesthetics in the more conventional sense of the word, colors, lines, shapes, a theological ideal, idealization, the river as a goddess, and the natural phenomena, the river as a physical form. Can the aesthetic be separated from the theological, from the natural, one could ask. What I was trying to show is that there's, there are many ways of seeing the river and one way of seeing the world would be to bring together the natural, the theological and the artistic and that perhaps is how an eco art history functions. The river then, the river Yamuna, operates at mul in multiple registers. If we read water as a text, if we read the river as a text, then draw allows then it allows us to draw attention to its socio-political and economic usefulness. The river was of course so important for riverine trade, but also agriculture. River Bridge was a pastoral community, but its capacity, the river's capacity to act as a substance that makes possible symbolic maneuvers for the material transformation of the world. In text, the river Yamuna is seen as the sensual drops of sweat that emerge during Krishna's lovemaking. Yamuna is ecstatic love in liquid form. If we then take seriously this idea that the river that flows from the Himalayas to its confluence with the Ganga as the physical sweat that emerges during Krishna's lovemaking, the river simultaneously becomes manifest, that is of the world, and unmanifest, that is transcendent. Conceivably, it is this theological coterminity of the manifest, the unmanifest, the physical, and the spiritual that also led the artist of the 1560s painting to trace the journey of the river diagonally across the picture plane to a place elsewhere, the place that is beyond presence, the place that is beyond representation. Unlike the theatrical staging of the riverscape in manuscripts, in earlier manuscripts, for instance, the 1520s manuscript, the prominence of the river in the 1560s folio offers up a different way of understanding the relationship between art and culture, nature and, and culture. In the book, I place the river in another matrix, one that is structured around the global flow of water and air. And here I'm referring to what climate historians describe as the Little Ice Age, a period between 1550 and 1850 that witnessed the climate of Europe becoming harsher, that is becoming colder with expanding glaciers. And here is a map, uh, a, a, a chart that shows how the temperatures really fell in this period in Europe. The flow of polar air extended over Europe. Farmlands were destroyed in Norway and Iceland. In West Africa, on the other hand, the Sahel or the dry frontiers of the Saharan fringe pulled southward. In Mexico, the most severe droughts in the past 600 years had ensued in this period. South Asia, also saw unprecedented droughts and famines. The El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO, a warming and cooling of the ocean surface along the coast of Peru that affects rainfall in the Indian Ocean was one of the severest climatic disturbances in this period. The effect of the turbulence led to a global upheaval with massive risk, rain scarcity in India lasting between 1554 
the first of these droughts would hit India in 1554, leading to the failure of monsoon. Badoni, for instance, described the famine as divine rage and asserted rhetorically that the scarcity of rain and shortness of grain led to man eating his fellow men. Now, accounts of cannibalism during climatic catastrophes abound in early modern narratives, but Mughal taxation records clearly indicate that between 1554 and 1556, there was a massive crisis of food crops. The elite were also affected. Mughal, the Mughal courtier Abul Fazal, for instance, writes about the scarcity where his family of 70 could only obtain two pounds of rice, which was set to boil in earthenware vessels and the warm water distributed. It is precisely at this point when you have the first massive droughts of the Little Ice Age that we see the artist of the Bhagavata visualizing a system of the materiality of the river that exceeds a hydrology that disciplines, measures, or subordinates water's force. The natural, one would argue then, undoubtedly shaped the aesthetic. But one also has to be careful with, one has to proceed with caution because these are products of very different dynamisms. The links between painting practices and drought should offer neither a deterministic history of the environment's agency, nor a reductionist non-anthropocentric history of, the, of art. Rather, what I argue for is a transversal moment, movement from the optical sensibility made visible in the Bhagavata Purana, the optical sensibility of, of literally making the river central to the narrative. And from there, we could go to the natural environment or vice versa. And that could open up a field that foregrounds the political, the social, the theological, and the visual imperatives of seeing water in an age of unusual droughts. The question that I really want to ask is, what does it mean to see ecologically? We talked about flowing water. So let's turn to the solidity of stone. An enormous sandstone temple to Krishna was consecrated in the 1590s in, in Vrindavan in Praj. By the 19th century, the temple is already being described by architectural historians, such as James Ferguson, as the most impressive religious edifice Hindu art has ever produced. And today, this particular temple has become a key monument for the history of early modern architecture. The scholars have suggested that the color of the sandstone used to construct the Mughal capital in Fatehpur Sikri, the red sandstone, and the similar sandstone being used in Govindev, suggests that a new Hindu architecture typology is emerging in the 16th century that brings together earlier architectural types with, with Mughal, contemporaneous Mughal architecture. The Govindev temple in Vrindavan and Akbar's capital city is separated by 40 miles. And both indeed share similar architectural idioms. For instance, the brackets, the serpentine brackets, or a largely austere surface. When we think of Hindu temple architecture, we imagine the surface covered with architectural and figural relief, but the Govinda temple comparatively is far more austere. So scholars have argued that it is indeed in, con in conversation with Mughal architecture. Now this argument that, that, that one of the key monuments of Vrindavan, a Hindu pilgrimage site is being constructed, keeping Mughal architectural idioms in mind is an important one because it underscores the cultural and creative interactions across religious and political boundaries. 
So even if we think about the Isarda Bhagavata and see how Mughal painting influences uh, painting practices, Hindu painting practices, or if we see how Mughal architecture influences Hindu temple architecture, keeping in mind that this, this scholarship has been, has been written in the last 20 years, after right-wing anti-Muslim politics has taken a virulent turn, it further highlights Govindev's architectural syncretism that brought together Hindu and Muslim visual forms. And more recently, if you think about Yogi Adityanath wanting to rethink the Agra Museum to showcase Braj culture, or even the cont contestations that have happened over the Krishna Janamuhumi temple complex in Mathura. So as much as there is a right-wing attempt to, 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 to make Braj in, in, in a certain way and to think about the relation between Hinduism and Muslim Islam in the early modern period through contemporary politics, what temples like the Govindev show is that we, you cannot separate out the Islamic cultures of Mughal India from the Hindu cultures of, of Braj and the other pilgrimage sites. And in that sense, the temple, the syncretic arguments that, that suggest that, that the Govindev is really bringing together Hindu and Muslim typologies is a very important one. But there is more to be said. The mineralogical composition of the Govindev suggests that the temple was built using the stone from a nearby hill, the Govardhan Hill, who is considered alive by devotees and pilgrims. Now, common sense tells us that rocks are inert. Yet, according to local narratives, the hill was the manifest form of Krishna and could sense pain if he was hurt. And on your right, you see a 19th century votive painting, a pitch Y, that shows the hill as the divine body. Literally, the rock becomes the divine body, the divine body becomes rock. The worship of Govardhan then involved imagining the hill as Krishna himself. Stone in this context is immanent with energy. It's vital energy. It's the alchemic quality of stone as elemental matter that made the hill both a sacred site, a living being, and a natural rock formation. And it was this stone that was used to construct the Govindev, thus shaping the very fabric of that particular temple. Now, the idea of the Hindu temple seems predisposed to such a revisionist analysis. From the early 20th century, much has been written on the histories of Hindu temple architecture. Scholars have routinely emphasized the symbolic nature of architecture as a representation of the universe, a microcosmic symbol of the primordial macrocosm. From the 1970s and the 80s, uh, new, what is called new historicism, uh, scholars have brought in questions of power, patronage, politics, but when we talk about the physical form of the temple, the, the, the literal, the, the visual form of the temple, most scholarship customarily slip back to thinking about the temple as a symbolic microcosm of that primordial macrocosm. But I ask, so in my chapter on stone, I then ask, what if we take stone not just as symbolic, what if we take that the, the material, the filament with which the temple is built, not just as symbolic, but immanent with energy? Each, the material itself was, uh, according to texts, was, was powerful enough to incite love for Radha. This beautiful text from the 16th century that talks about the color red and the, the pigment, the dhatu, and how red can, can, can incite love for Krishna. So what if we see this stone literally vibrant with energy, vibrant with that material that is the body of Krishna? Uh, 
embodied ecological clusters becomes the locus of analysis. Water, the goddess Yamuna, the sweat that emerges from Krishna's love, land, the Govardhan hill, a hill that bleeds when wounded, forest, the sacred groves, the kunjas, where Krishna roamed with the gopis and where plants were considered sentient beings. And finally, architecture that works with the idea of ether, akasha, the natural element that holds together the principal components of Braja's sacred ecosystem. Obscuring the boundaries between art and the environment, animate beings, inanimate matter, an engagement with the subjectivity of rocks, plants, rivers, dust, that allows for an exploration of what an eco-art history could be. An eco-art history demands that we take the natural environment as constitutive rather than symbolic or emblematic. It obscures the boundaries between subjects and objects. It the very substance of rock becomes entangled in relational flows that connects representation, religion, and the environment. An eco-art history becomes operative when the history of art and architecture brings together and reconciles phenomenology with the everyday materiality of the environment. Such a gesture can have significant implication on how we engage with the materiality of art in process problematizing the purported rift between humans and the planet we inhabit. Thank you. I think I'll stop here and we can open it up for a conversation. Um, let me turn on my uh, video as well. Ah, wonderful. Thank you so much for um, a really precise and uh, some poor, complete uh, presentation of the two chapters plus the overarching uh, thematic of the book. So I just want to begin very small, in a small way, our conversation. And I would um, really love to begin with the very same painting that you began with, which is the Isarda painting. And uh, I, I love that painting uh, because it's such an early painting and it's also so dynamic. And um, the image itself uh, is uh, uh, kind of taking forward the transformation of art history in this period. Uh, the way that the diagonal cuts across the, the, the picture plane. So I wanted to ask you a question. Um, the, and this is, this is not to negate the idea that the river um, has, a, has a theological uh, presence in the painting, but to actually uh, pair it with another idea. And I think I'd like to, you to explore that and see if pairing it with such an idea, uh, uh, such an interpretation of that painting would, how that might impact, let's say this thing you're trying to do, which is a paradigm shift. Let's not be modest. You want to, uh, uh, you want to kind of produce a paradigm shift in, in uh, South Asian art history by introducing concerns which are not just uh, about the human, but also about uh, uh, the, the more than human. I won't say non-human, but the more than human, right? So let's just look at that page. Um, so the Isadha page also suggests that Krishna and by extension Krishna Bhakti um, are fundamentally as impossible to domesticate as the Yamuna. That's how I see that gigantic rushing uh, river from the left to the right cutting zoom right through the pages. That certain powerfuls are so fundament, power forces are so fundamentally uncontrollable that it is not, but also uh, uh, that maybe they would not necessarily have connected it to the idea of climate change, the way that you already told us, in, uh, in the way that we define that term. So if we take the idea of climate change itself as a climate in the interior self, right? Like the transformation that bhakti brings and that 
that transformation then is exteriorized in the natural world, in the behaviors in the outside world. So would you explore this a little bit with me? Absolutely. In fact, uh, so there, so Vallavacharya, for instance, writes about this idea of the inside and the outside, and even the notion of swabhav hmm. and the idea of what is what is true nature. Hmm. So I think even 16th century theologians are playing, and I use the word play, keeping the history of the term in, the, in a yes. very long Lila, Lila. Uh, Lila, exactly. So, uh, so they are really working with the idea of nature, the nature of the self, but the nature of, of what is in the environment and the duality of what is nature. When we, when, when we, are, when, when we think about the nature of the, the swa, and, mm. and then connect it to the idea of, of bhava, and then we think about the environment as nature. So there is, I also think that I would hesitate to have one big argument for the whole of Krishna Bhakti. Mm. So within Pushti Marga traditions, for instance, there is sort of a text that actually talk about the idea of bhava and the idea of swa. Within, let's say, Gaudiya traditions, on the other hand, Chaitanya, uh, has has this, the I mean our main source is of course the hagiography written much later, where where you have uh, this description of Chaitanya dancing and singing with the trees and the trees are responding of Braj are responding to Chaitanya, so there is this very interesting I, and I love it how you put it the climate of the self and the climate of the environment are yes. really mutually implicated in this. I, I wish I'd used that term in my book. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're absolutely right that, that that there is a climate of the self and the, the way in which the self is transformed in the in in a in pilgrimage, and the, and the climate of the of the environment and how the, the imbrication between these two two categories, I think, work out to the concept of Leela or play. Which is, of course, so central to bhakti, bhakti traditions. Um, I'd like to just transition from that that aspect that you just were talking about, um, uh, a kind of uh, bhava, to actually talk about uh, what you what you so beautifully said, uh, even in this talk, but more fully in your book itself, where you said, "Would you talk about architecture, the types of architecture you discuss, to behold water?" in a time of drought and climate change, but also in a time when the water itself becomes a divinity in a new kind of way. Water was always divine. Ganga was divine. Saraswati was divine. Uh, the, the kuns and the, 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 the water bodies that human beings made were divinized. Uh, they, were, they were made and then they were divinized, right? So it's both naturally divine and then divinization also happens, right? How does the architecture itself produce affect when the water, when it wants to uh, treat water as affect, right? So the, there's architecture that produces affect in order to create water as affect. So you, you talked about the ghats. So for example, the ghats themselves are very affective, very emotionally expansive and complex experiences, uh, spaces of very complex experiences in Vrindavan, in Mathura. Uh, and of course you mentioned this, but uh, you know, the Yamuna was a highway. The, the cities of Mathura and Vrindavan were oriented towards uh, uh, the water. It's only after the British started entering into these cities and expanded their road networks that gradually the orientation to the river for commercial traffic moved back onto the road and the river became more and more uh, a kind of uh, sacred space, uh, solely a sacred space. So could you talk a little bit about the architecture itself as a way, as how it assists and perceive how it is designed to produce affect in order to experience the affective possibilities of water. Absolutely. And I think so, I mean, there are two instances in the book where I talk about the, the interaction between architecture and water. One is the cha first chapter on water. So when, when I was doing field work, uh, I, if, 
I mean, those of, of us who've gone to uh, Mathura, there is this Vishram Ghat, which has a Thorana or a gateway on the Ghat. Now, historically, we all know gateways are, I mean, there's so much written on gateways, like the liminal space. That's where like the, the Thorana of a stupa, and it's the outside and the inside. So there is that history of the Thorana. Thoranas have always been seen as liminal thresholds. On the other hand, you have a lot of architectural histories on framing and end framing, starting from Alberti, who writes about the frame, to Derrida. Now, this context to say that when I was in Vishram Ghat, there's this weird Thorana in the middle of Vishram Ghat that leads nowhere. Mm. All you do with that Thorana is you can see the river. You can see the river passing behind it. And I was trying to think about like, why would anyone build a Thorana in the Ghat when it is not, it's not a passage. No one is going through the Thorana. And then my, I was trying to ask myself is that, so what am I seeing here? Is the river framing architecture or is the architecture framing the river? Or can we separate these two the nature, the nature and the culture, the natural and the culture here. And so I, I argue that, you know, what is so interesting about this particular Torana is that it goes against a normative understanding of gateways because gateways have historically been seen as an entrance point, a threshold, a way to enter somewhere. But all, I, all one does with that gateway is look at flowing water. And again, the verticality of the gateway, the horizontality of the river, and then the river flows behind the gateway and then then and that is where i think architecture produces affect but it's the river that is also producing architecture hmm. and i think it is that rhizomatic interaction that like gotari for instance talks about the the the, the, the how one has to think about the natural and the, the three ecologies so i think that's where i was so intrigued by the idea that that you cannot separate out the natural from the cultural because if we are looking at the gateway, we are also seeing the river. And the river and the gateway are, are part of one's aesthetic system. And that is one in the first chapter. In the fourth chapter, I talk about fountains. And mm. I talk about fountains and, and pillars that mimic the flow of water. So I talk about this particular 19th century temple in my fourth chapter. Uh, strange temple, uh, strange <laughs> temple. I mean, <laughs> so strange. I'll tell you why it's strange. It's because so it's it has a little bit of Lucknowy architecture. The gateway is like the Rumi Darwaza in Lucknow. Then it has these Western columns, and then it has all sorts of combinations, from architectural elements from different parts of literally the world putting together come together so i use that to talk about a different uh, notion of cosmopolitanism but what was really intriguing for me is that you had the 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 the, the columns the the columns which were 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 curled were actually being reflected by the water so again you see how the water and architecture are actually being part of one system and that's perhaps where one can think about the natural world and the cultural world, which in, let's say, from the 17th century enlightenment th thought, we've been told are two separate domains, were actually engaged, very closely engaged with each other. When, when I think about the, the, your book, and especially that last chapter on the Shaji Temple, uh, I even go back further to the previous chapter where you talk about Deeg and the amazing uh, engineering uh, uh, technologies that were marshaled together to create uh, an architecture for hydro aesthetics, right? So could you talk a little bit about Deeg and, uh, and the sort of uh, celebration of rain uh, and the, 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 the creation of an architecture, its naming, all those sort of things? Because I think I, our audience would really enjoy the, hearing about that. Right, absolutely. I think if at some point I want to write a book on hydro, hydro aesthetics, as I call it, the idea of how water and architecture, and not just and not just not just an architecture that dominates water, that that controls water, that forces water into a resource, hmm. but water, how water 
works like for instance the job the 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 the, the garden pavilions of Teague, not only were they were they named with the seasons but scholars who've actually done archaeological uh, work at at Teague have shown how even stones were kept to emulate the sound of thunder yes so the, so so there is this deep, deep implication uh, of how one thinks about the environment and how built spaces. And I, and I think with Deeg and garden, garden pavilions, it's not just architecture because it's the flowers, the plants, the landscape, and it's really a, a, to, a totality in that sense. What, what is fascinating is how a totality is being created by bringing together. Uh, Deeg is really interesting because um, the 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 effect of the monsoon the the uh, let me put it this way the artificial production of nature, right? So uh, rain through the chajas and then the pressure through the pillars uh, to make the metal water pressure uh, put through the pillars to make the balls rumble and create the sound of thunder uh, as this happens in a very very as you rightly pointed out very dry, arid landscape. If you don't have water, it would become almost desert, right? I mean, that whole area. Uh, so uh, th that's a very powerful uh, thing. I, I want to also talk a little bit about the kunjas because we didn't get enough time in your presentation with the kunjas. Um, you have a, a beautiful garden tradition that uh, is developing, two beautiful garden traditions that are developing simultaneously in the region. Um, there must have been more, but we know as our historians and architectural historians, two solid ones. One is the Mughal uh, tradition, which is centered on the tomb garden or just the garden that was meant for hunting or a quasi jungle garden. Uh, so there's a kind of planned contained uh, space for nature. And then you have uh, uh, these kunjas that develop. Uh, and uh, they're associated with Krishna. He is called Nikunja Bihari or Nikunja Bihari, which is such a beautiful expression. It makes me so emotional to even think of that. So could you talk about the kunjas a little bit and the horticultural aspects of it, the way that uh, the plants themselves are trained and the way that the, the, the devotional experience is structured through the passage, through the kunj. So I thought that was such a beautiful part of your book. I don't want any of our audiences to miss that. Thank you. So when we think about garden histories in South Asia, the, in the early modern period, like post 1500s, it's either Mughal gardens or it's about colonial botany or it's about the representation of plants as, as a form of governance. So more uh, the history of gardens in South Asia has more or less been a history of domination, of, of control, of, of, of ordering nature. And I had a painting, for instance, of Mahmud Shah in his garden. And here you have the king riding his horse and looking down on the land that he owns and controls and he remakes. So again, much of my field work, so when I was in Vrindavan and I, uh, the kunja, the one or two kunjas that remain from the 18th century uh, was a very different experience. And I'm like kind of tall, I'm six feet two. So for me to walk <laughs> yes, through the are. kunja, I had to bend. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to bend and then my shirt would get stuck on the, on the, on the, on the plant and I was like, okay, this is not the gardens that we read about. This is a very different garden. I mean, just viscerally, corporeally, like to, to go through that garden, you would have to, I would, especially me, I would have to bend a lot. And that, all of these experiences that I had was in a way really informed how I wrote this book. It was really a corporeal, physical, the dust, the taste of the dust and your shirt getting torn in a, on a, in a jasmine bower. And, and what I realized that the kunjas of Vrindavan are literally a, a manifestation of the kunjas of poetry. From, from, from Jayadeva's Gita Govindam onwards, you have these 
beautiful descriptions of, of the dark kunjas where, where Radha would go to look for Krishna. But the Mughal garden is not that. The Mughal garden is all about order and control and the, 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 and the, and the straight lines. And that, uh, what, and for me, what is also interesting where it goes back to what you were talking about, Dick, is that this is completely artificial. This is happening in the 18th century when, when, when mercantile urbanism is, is efflorescent and Mathura is one of the most urban centers and, and there are no, those kunjas of Gita, they don't exist. There is no, no forest. And we have again, taxation records that show that, that massive deforestation is happening and new towns are being set up overnight. And Chris Bailey writes about it very nicely that Barzana, overnight a hamlet became a, 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 a town. So there is massive encroachment on the environment, which according to Vaishnava text is the space of poetics, the space of Krishna and Radha. So how, what I argue in that chapter is that it's precisely in this moment of massive deforestation that these gardens are being built that recreate the kunjas of poetry and painting. Mm -hmm. And what is also important to note is when we think about pre-modern uh, sacred groves, we have, scholarship has been, uh, has usually talked about it into some sort of a primordial virgin space untouched by modernity. But the 18th century is the cusp of modernity. East India Company, the Calcutta Botanical Gardens has been set up. So you have the Calcutta Botanical Gardens, you have the East India Company, you have company school paintings, which are depicting all of these MP albums and stuff like that. And it is precisely at that point, another notion of nature is being invented in Braj. But this nature is emerging from literature and painting. And that nature is not some sort of a primordial, sacred space, but it's really a fantasy, a, a fantasy that's being produced horticulturally within a very dense urban milieu. And for me, that was very interesting that, yes, the, yes, all gardens are, are simulacras in that sense. All gardens are simulated. But what is being simulated here is a notion of wilderness, the notion of, of deep jungle in the middle of uh, of a very dense urban milieu. And that, 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 that idea of, of, a, of a simulated garden is what was very interesting. Because again, in scholarship, whenever we talk about sacred groves, until very recently, there was a conception, and even in uh, a lot of sacred groves in Kerala, for instance, there was a conception that these are primordial virgin forests. But the kunjas were not primordial virgin forests, but they were complete romanticization, a self-romanticization within Vaishnava traditions. And this is not a top-down colonial project. This is not, not some British Brit colonial botanist imagining the kunjas of Vrindavan, but the, the, the gardeners and the poets and the writers literally thinking about what, what it means to inhabit that space. So I want to just move out of the book a little bit and to your method actually, and then I'm going to open it up uh, in a few minutes to our audience. Uh, so uh, one of the beautiful things about your um, book, uh, which I really enjoyed, was the variety of archival sources that you marshal to produce this, uh, uh, to produce your effort at creating a paradigm shift. So within that, I wanted to ask this question. Um, I'd like to ask this question is what, as you look through the archival material, as you um, looked at all these sites, you looked at paintings, you looked at, you walked through gardens, what do you see as being uh, at stake environmentally in reifying theological metaphors into stone or into plant life? I would really like you to contemplate that because I'm bringing you back to with that question to climate change. And then I'll ask one more question and then I'll stop. So the climate change and the environment, what is at stake environmentally? Because we can, so let me explain myself a little bit further. I think that might be helpful. So 
here uh, you have, so far you've talked to, to us about things that, that humans made, cultural forms that human beings made using nat natural uh, things like a river or stone substances and uh, imagining them as enlivened, as de deified or as divine and uh, stabilizing their meanings and creating c further cultural forms out of it. So it's not like a linear thing. No, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of looping and interwoven process. Uh, but such divin divinations of nature, uh, divinizations of nature, not divinations of nature, divinizations of nature, also create environmental consequences. And I'd want, like for you to contemplate a little bit on that because somebody like, for example, Jack Hawley, when he wrote uh, the, his new book, uh, uh, Krishna's Playground, uh, Brindavan in the 21st century is really contemplating uh, the environmental consequences that we're facing today. Uh, or David um, Haberman's book, uh, 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 David Haberman, no, yeah, David, Hmm. David Haberman, right? I always get com confused between Hardman and Haberman. Uh, uh, Haberman, uh, uh, the river of love and the age of pollution, which it's it's such a. When I read that cover, I was just like, oh my god, uh, you know, really painful thought. So I'd like for as you to um, talk a little bit about the emotional consequences after uh, the environmental consequences, the environmental stakes of this way of producing a landscape and treating a landscape. All right. So, uh, I, I mean, so as you can imagine, David Hellman's book was like very influential for this. And in fact, he wrote a review. I mean, he, he, wrote, a, he, he wrote a review of my book, which just got published in the Journal of American Academy of Religion, where he said, uh, a book written the 21st century does not address the 21st century. That is very strange. <laughs> <laughs> no, his point is like the title, you, you have a title called Climate Change, but you end in the 1800s and you actually don't address the question of, I mean, the massive ecological devastation, the fact that the river of life is a dead river. Now, like it has been declared a dead river that, don't, that it is only, it can only be used. I mean, the Yamuna can only be used for industrial purposes. So even David Hammond had, was asked, had the same question for in the review of my book is that, why aren't we addressing the, the, the very serious uh, climatic effects that are playing out in North India at this point in the Delhi Mathuragra region. Uh, so I and the human behavior, the be consequences of human behavior, right, particularly right. programs. Right. So even even if you you're right. So if you think about temples, if you think about gardens, these are are in a way transforming the environment. These are ways in which the environment there is no pristine environment. But uh, what is important to think about is the scale, the mm -hmm. scalarity of 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 intervention in the environment in terms of four temples in the 1600s, 10 temples in the 1700s to 3000 temples that are competing with Disney World today as Jack Hollywood would write about. So, this, and that's the Anthropocene argument that today we as a species have uh, such a pressure that we have become, a, <coughs> excuse me, we have become a geological agent. So the Anthropocene argument is precisely that, that even though from the prehistoric period, human beings have always intervened, have always managed and always transformed the environment. The, 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 the scalarity in which we have done it in, the, in, in our current geological epoch, the Anthropocene epoch, is unprecedented. And therefore, one has to, in a way, think about what the implications are. Let's say, especially in a pilgrimage site. I mean, we all know the immense burden of a pilgrimage site in terms of climate change and, and pollution. And Mathura, of course, is, is an industrial hub. And we know that the Agra is literally, I mean, the Taj Mahal, we all know what the effects are being. So that I would propose that we have to think about a scalar, scalar effect. So that is why I did not write on the contemporary. I did not write on the post, uh, the post-industrial or the post is because 
the scale of the Govindiv temple and the scale of temple architecture today are are cannot if we it's it's injustice to the past to to bring it together in the same cover of the same book. My own interest, I work on the 16th century, the 17th, I see myself as an early modernist. My own interest is it comes from this question that comes a lot from recent scholarship on what is eco-criticism or eco-art history that sees the pre-modern as primordial, that sees the pre-modern as pristine. The pre-modern becomes a backdrop to argue about environmental transformation today. And I, uh, there are many artists and scholars who picked up this thing, idea that that there were that the, the period before the Anthropocene was a period of of pristine ecological plenitude, a certain othering of the environment that happens. And I wanted to so, and I keep and I therefore let's say in the Kunja chapter I keep insisting that these are not pristine eco zones; these are man-made. So I'm I what my so I think methodologically there are two two ways I wanted to approach it. One was to sort of challenge the presentism of our ecological discourse, uh, the exceptionalism that we pro, that we see in terms of discourse today, and the second is of course the enlightenment discourse, the nature culture discourse, that the assumption that that uh, the ways in which enlightenment and, colo and colonialism as an effect of enlightenment has produced this binary between the nature, the, between nature and culture. What the actors in my book show that despite that, despite the violence of enlightenment, despite the nature culture binary that is so fundamental to how we see, imagine the environment, they could think about implications. They could think about mutual implications. They could think about the relationship between nature and culture in a way that enlightenment does not allow where the human being is the sovereign the human being being because the species becomes the sovereign so i think my my interest was both to challenge the presentism presentism the presentism of eco, eco writings on art that that sort of exceptionalized the present day and also in a way rethink that enlightenment debate by offering new ways or ways of thinking uh, and the relationship between the world of art making and the world of nature and culture. And in that context, this book is not alone. I mean, Caroline Dean has written on Inca Stone. There is a lot of scholars who are looking at what, what in, the America, in North American academics is called indigenous epistemologies or essentially other ways of thinking about the earth that are not a history of enlightenment science. So I want so for to, me those hmm. so, yeah I'll stop there yeah uh, I, I'm going to open this up but I want to uh, leave you with one more question you um, you I would I would like you to just talk as we open it up for the audience what are Indic words whether they're in Braj Bhasha or in Sanskrit or in Bengali, because Gaudiya Sampraday often uses Bengali also, right? Uh, for talking about environmental uh, transformations, not necessarily climate change with the way that we think about climate change today, but about environmental transformations in this period. And that would, I think, help us bring this larger project of yours, which is connected to a global attention to environmental transformation back right to the center of the Krishna heartland. So what were the words that they used? And after that, uh, Raghu, I request you to please open it up to the audience. And then I will um, start asking the audience's questions. Yeah. So so the, the I think for me, what is interesting is that Braj in a way occupies so many linguistic uh zones there is the Persianate world there is the the Braj bhakti world and then there is sort of the mewari marwari rajput literature and, and and mostly i whatever i have encountered from my little readings of texts is that it's always in a way tied into a certain divine wrath mm. so badoni would also talk about like the qu question the the famines of the little ice age 
are being seen as divine rod. Jahangir is writing about it. So, so I mean, it's the pre 18th century. So everything is tied up to the two in a way uh, as beyond human. And when I mean beyond human, I don't mean plants and rod, but sort of the, the divine world. So I think much of the argument about transformation in climate in the climate change, which is being seen and which is being recorded, there are a lot of references to transformation in the environment, uh, in our administrative accounts, in literary accounts, in 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 in, in travel accounts. But most of it either says, let's say, there were a lot of lions here, but we don't have any more lions, or they blame God or God's wrath for it. So I think there is always that understanding of environmental transformation, which would only change in the 18th century with modern enlightenment science, which would actually argue that these are disasters, whether man-made or, or naturally occurring. So you would you would probably use fine words like akal and those kinds of words? Yeah. Yes. OK, so let me begin with the audience's questions. And I. Um, uh, this is a very nice, simple question, and I'm going to start us off with that one, which is Binu Malik's question. Which area specifically today is Braj, and where is Govardhan Hill? I think that's a good thing to just get the ground established. But that is also a very difficult question. <laughs> Braj of the imagination. I know. Where is Braj? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, the Goloka is Braj. I... I I'm not sure, honestly, because I don't think we can have a clear map that says broadly. It's I can name the the towns in Braj, but also the pilgrimage route has changed over time. Literally, every, every 20, 30 years, the pilgrimage route changes, but it's mostly Mathura, Vrindavan, Gokul, Barsana, uh, Deeg. So it's the towns essentially after Hathras. No, if you're coming down Delhi, Hathras, right after. Anyway, but but that said, I I'm not sure if I can actually. I mean, I have a map of Braj in my book, but it's very vague because we can't say that this is where Braj. And that's the beauty of Braj. In fact, and there's this beautiful idea that you have a Braj. Kanak Vrindavan is in Jaipur and you have the Gupta Vrindavan in, in Calcutta, and you have the new Vrindavan in West Virginia. So Braj can also be replicated in real space. So yeah, it's a very interesting question. And uh, Govardhan Hill itself is in Vrindavan. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's one- just outside of, one, just outside of- Outside of, it's a 15 minutes drive Vrindavan. from Vrindavan. Yeah. Yeah. It's a 15 minutes okay, drive from- Let's go to the next question. Uh, which is from Harshvardhan Bhatt. Um, really enjoyed listening to this talk and discussion and many thanks Shugato and Annapurna. Thank you so much. Um, Shugato, I researched the monsoon and was interested if you could speak to the kind of geo histories that parallel with the moment of monsoon failure that you invoke. Are there intersections with geological meteorological history that you found or are there readings from archival uh, temporality from the story itself that you identify as the monsoon. I'm fascinated about that moment and would be delighted to find out more. By the way, your hydro architecture project sounds great. So I think basically just to simplify it for us uh, is, I think uh, Harshvardhan is asking like, um, uh, uh, what, uh, what, between what is happening to the earth in this period and what you found uh, within the archive, is there any, are there any kinds of intersections especially when this um, kind of uh, elaboration of a monsoonal culture as being this profoundly beautiful experience comes about. So, so the idea of the monsoon obviously is being articulated differently in different archives. So you have the Mughal archive, which is obviously talking about uh, drought relief. It's talking about various ways to cope with failing monsoons, and and also the emperors are asking why, 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 why is this happening to us? So there are all these debates about whether God has turned against us, or whether it's uh, whether it's uh, whether there are natural causes. But the 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 history of meteorology is 18th century discipline. So so again, you have 
uh, William Roxburgh, for instance, in the 18th century, uh, early 19th century, collecting data about historic droughts. And that, and, and finding certain patterns, which is today what we call the Little Ice Age. I mean, he didn't use the term Little Ice Age, but he found patterns from local narratives lo and question of archive that Annapurna was talking about. So via William Rock's work, we have a sense of the historic archives or historic uh, climatic variabilities that are happening in the 16th and the 17th century. That's a very different uh, archive with the setting up of the meteorological society, setting up of um, modern scientific study of, meet, of, of climate change, which I would say is squarely the mid to late 18th century phenomenon. That said, there are both aesthetic engagements with mo monsoons, administrative engagement with monsoons, even, even theological engagement with monsoon, and they reflect differently depending on which archive you are looking at. Um, I'd like us to uh, turn to Srinivas Murthy's um, question. Would you like to comment on the connection between climate awareness and spirituality? I think in some ways he's coming back to the climate within the self and the climate that is happening in the world. So it's a difficult question because one also has to be careful of right-wing forces appropriating climate change and, and, and not just in India, but also in the US. I mean, it's, it's a very complex rela relationship between religion and climate change. And so, or again, if you wanna distinguish between religion and spirituality, that's a different, but the different set of question. But if you're talking about spirituality per se, certainly, I mean, there is much written. I mean, the Pope himself wrote on climate change. So certainly there is much that can be thought through in how spirituality allows for a certain engagement with the environment in, you know, in, a, in, in the custodian model. Um, I'd like to then bring you to a question from your teacher. From who, I know, I just uh, saw that. <laughs> Professor Shivji Panikar's question is, the period of con that you're working on is ruled, uh, large parts of the area, region are ruled by Islamic rulers. It would be nice to hear more about the planned engagement of, uh, uh, of Islam with nature, uh, the engagement of Islam with nature in terms of natural resources and its uses. So there is, uh, Shivji, first of all, hi. Secondly, uh, so there is a lot of work. <laughs> there is a lot of work on on nature and and Islam, and there's a so there is a metaphysical, the philosophical uh, engagement with with nature from from Islamic theology. There is also a lot of interesting work done in terms of 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 let's say with let's say with Jahangir, who is setting up plantations, who's who is hybridizing plants and animals. So. Certainly scholars have looked at both the practical, but also the philosophical engagement with the environment, with an Islamic thought and practice. Uh, what I, in this book, I wanted to do was to look at what is called the Islamic Kate rather than the Islamic, that is look at cultures that, that, that are in conversation with, let's say the, the great Mughal cultures, but are not directly part of the court patronage system. In my next book, I am going to go back to, to Mughal notions of nature and think about how the Mughals were, what does it, what does early, what does science during the time of Jahangir mean? Is it, is it, is it an equivalent science that's developing in Europe or do we have to sort of intersect scientificism in the Mughal court with let's say theological notions or spirituality? Okay, um, I would like to ask a question uh, from um, uh, two different points about the contemporary moment. So one is from somebody whose initials are SS. Uh, thank you. What do you think about art, how art, art, and art, art and architecture from now would depict uh, when we look back at it centuries from now. So it's a speculative question. It's a fun question. You can play with it. With respect okay. to climate shifts and environment. It would be even fun for me to ask you to contemplate Why what don't would you? 
<laughs> I thought you were answering the question. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm extending the question, not answering it. Um, uh, 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 that would not be fair. I'm, I'm only a discussant. You are the, the, the primary person uh, today. Uh, I think, no, it's a very interesting question because, I mean, uh, Amitav Ghosh rec recently wrote that the climate change is a crisis of the imagination. What he meant is that as, I mean, you can have political discourse and scientific and uh, economic uh, interventions in the realm of climate change, but if we cannot approach climate change as a crisis of the mental, of what is what an art school would say mentality, but sort of imagination, then we will never be able to take the conversation further because policy cannot change people's hearts. It is the role of art, it is the role of cinema, it is the role of literature to, to work at that level of intimacy, that level of efficacy. And that's what Amitabh Ghosh was trying to argue in, 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 a, in a book called The Great Derangement, where he says that the climate crisis is the crisis of the imagination. So I think that it is an important question and it is, a, it is on, on artists and poets and philosophers and filmmakers and musicians to make climate crisis, not just a question of policy, but a question of existence. Uh, dear SS, I'd like to supplement our, uh, our uh, main speaker's uh, answer to your question by asking you to please look at uh, Jack Hawley's book, uh, because the architect of this gigantic temple that's uh, uh, ISKCON temple that's being built in Vrindavan is building a skyscraper temple, but he says it is a green temple. So that, that, that climate change is already entering the discourse of temple making in a very uh, concrete and discernible way. So I don't think they're ready-made answers to hundreds of years now, but there's already potential uh, answers right now that people are trying to handle. I'm gonna move to um, Dr. Sita Reddy talking from Hyderabad. Uh, um, uh, well, hi Sita, I want to um, uh, bring about her question. Um, would you, either of you like to comment on one trend in climate change legal activism in New Zealand and Uttarakhand on the river as a legal person, as a living entity? You go, Shubhata, first. So I think it's a, <coughs> how do I put this? It, it, it reminds me of a, uh, uh, novel, I think, of Mosha Devi, where, where she writes about this, this particular community in, in Jharkhand or Bihar. Uh, and you have this mining company coming in and wanting to destroy a mountain to take out the box for bauxite. And the, the community immediately declares the hill as a sacred forest, a sacred mountain. So what it does is essentially uses these ideas of pre-modern systems of animacy to fight industrial uh, neoliberal extractive economies. So I think it's a very interesting way to fight fight uh, big big corporations that that extract resources from from these regions, and it's been happening even let's say in the U.S where although rivers haven't been declared legal entities, but the claim to ri rivers as more than a natural resource, to claim to a river as, as an entity, as, as an affective entity. So I think the, the, the potential for activism becomes far more, uh, the potentials exponentially increase the moment we take it out of the domain of resources. So as long as the river is a resource, as long as a forest is a resource, as long as a mountain is a resource, extraction becomes possible. But the moment we either declare it a legal entity or we declare it a sacred entity or we work with certain models of thinking about it as an entity itself rather than a resource, the debates get transformed. And I think that's what it is, that's what, uh, that's what is sort of the potential of that. Again, my my concern is also with sort of 
the idea of the river as a goddess is, I mean, if the Ganga is Ganga Ma, then how do I, as a Muslim, engage with that riverscape? So there is a political, uh, there's a potential of that sort of argument going towards a right-wing ecological discourse that is very problematic. Um, Sita, I'd like to address this question, uh, uh, your question, um, to supplement the last thing that Shugato just said. Uh, I think this, today, if we declare a river as a living entity with uh, a legal personage and um, claims and rights on human beings, right? It produces not just a, a, a crisis between the secular state and uh, sacred, uh, sacred uh, uh, orientations of the citizens of this country, sacred commitments of the citizens, some of the citizens of this country, not everybody is a believer, right? But it also produces a crisis within, let's say, um, a, a sacred system. So somewhere in the, from the 18th century onwards, the river was the identity, or I hate that word identity, but the river as a being was split into two. So one, it was subjugated, exploited, and then instrumentalized. Simultaneously, it was also uh, promoted, let's say, in, in sacred literature or in tourism literature as the most holy place in India, the most holy river in India. So that's the Ganga, for example. So you have that kind of continuing even today uh, when we declare things as um, uh, uh, important, uh, uh, I, what is it? The Water Authority of India declares uh, uh, the Ganga River route as a water highway number one, right? So it's it's exploited as a 500 million some World Bank project to make uh, uh, terminals on it in Varanasi and Patna and all these sort of things. And the cleaning itself is also not just about sacr sacrality, but it's also a kind of uh, commercial enterprise, all these sort of things. Now, when you say, when you begin to say that the river itself is a living being, you're asking for a integration to happen, but can the integration, how will that integration happen? And what terms will be the integration of its diverse lives? As a, as a highway, as a water source to water plants, as a spiritual being that nurtures. And this is not a ready-made answer. I don't think we have ready-made answers. And this is, if, if let's say uh, religious institutions, for example, like the, the, the person, the engineer who is the Mahant at the Sankat Mochan temple uh, in Varanasi is trying to do very, very seriously. How do you, as a, a, as a world that has disenchanted uh, of much of na the nature in, in terms, in ways which produce a certain kind of uh, commercial profit-making instrumental relationship to it, extractive relationship to it. How do you then uh, come to a place of re-enchantment uh, without necessarily uh, stepping into uh, the river of Hindutva, for example? Uh, so this, these are questions that I, I can only answer your question with a question by reframing it some more. I want to, uh, uh, we're approaching the end and of the- I just want to remind ourselves that Narendra Modi began his last electoral campaign on the ghats of Varanasi, on right. the Ganga, with a massively media orchestrated project of saving Ganga Ma. So again, that, I mean, I, I am completely, I'm very wary of that sort of a movement to declare rivers as sacred beings because it goes, and especially with what's happening now, it's, it's very difficult to split a secular India that, that, that our people have fought for over the last 50, 60 years to, to transform that into a Hindu landscape, even though Dianaic would argue for a Hindu India or whatever. Um, the last question we'll take for today, because we're running out of time, and thank you. Before I conclude, I want to thank all the uh, audience, as well as all the question askers, the questioners, and as well as the staff and uh, uh, at the Bangalore International Center, and most of all, Shugato Rai, for being with us uh, today to do this program. Uh, Hitangi's uh, question is, uh, 
she begins by saying, it's been a very interesting presentation. What I'd like to know is that art historians so far have been analyzing such painted folios on the basis of compositional techniques developed by artists through deploying their characteristic visual idioms. However, your approach unravels another aspect to reading paintings through ecology. To what extent would you credit the artistic genius in the creation of such painted folios? And I think what she's also saying, which she didn't say, inciting you, the artistic genius that incited you to approach these paintings through ecology. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a million dollar question, the role of art, the role of the artist uh, in South Asian painting. I am very care, wary and careful of privileging the figure of the artist. Uh, simply because I see it as part of a complex. So to give you a good example of the book on the temple, the chapter of the temple or the Govindev temple, at the very point when the architect, whose name we know, that's all we know, the name that he was from Delhi, is designing this temple, you have theologians writing about the temple in the, in, in the same city town. So I think at least in, in say the pre-modern world, we have to think about artistic practice as a product of a complex rather than a certain individual uh, genius, whether it's the artistic genius or the literary genius. Because it's the theological text that is informing practice and vice versa, the artistic, literally the books on Braj are being written, the, especially the Gaudiya, the Chaitanya tradition, the books are being written at the same time when the temples are being constructed. So art, ar architecture and, and, and theology are actually working in tandem to construct, to make Braj. And I would, I, it would be difficult for me to say that this part is the role of the artist and this part is the role of Rupa Goswami or the, or the theologian. I think it's really part of a massive complex or intellectual complex that produces both texts and architecture. Because I also think that, which is something that literary historians have actually never done. But I also think that all the texts, the Gaudiya tradition texts could only be written because of the architecture. The architecture in a way prompted a way of thinking about uh, Mathura and Vrindavan in the, in the Mahatmya traditions and the Gaudiya traditions. So I think, again, I mean, no one's really said, looked at how architecture influences or built practices or visual practices influence the writing of theological texts. And I think it's mutually, mutually constructive. Thank you so much. And uh, we wish you a very festive holiday season. Please take care of yourself and be safe. And we extend the same to all our audience as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annapurna. Thank okay. you, Raghu, for having Thank me. You. It's such a pleasure. Thank you, Shugato. Um, we're truly fortunate to be introduced to such an original and groundbreaking work on eco art, nature, geography, and climate. And Annapurna, as always, your incisive scholarship has elevated this conversation. Uh, thank you, audiences, for joining us on a Sunday morning. Thank you. Thank you.